Please welcome our panel. Thank you. So I am Ken Perry, formerly of Occident Capital. Uh, I am now a consultant helping uh, people in the areas of risk management, quantitative investing, and artificial intelligence as it relates to finance. And I'm delighted to present a super interesting panel from lots of different backgrounds. We have an interesting picture uh, up there. I'll leave that as a mystery for you uh, for just two minutes and ask our panelists to introduce themselves starting from Jorge and moving uh, across, please. Hi. Hello. Yes, hi. Thank you, Ken. Um, I just thank the organizers for inviting me this evening, this afternoon to this wonderful event and especially to be in this um, exciting panel. I think it's probably the best panel of the day, perhaps of the whole event. So I'm very lucky to be here. Um, I work at Cantor Fitzgerald in uh, global markets look covering uh, trade execution as well as capital raising and portfolio advisory for institutional accounts globally, uh, asset owners like pension funds, insurance companies, as well as sovereign wealth funds. We try to apply traditional uh, investment models as well as integrate that with hybrid new technologies, looking to manage risk in the best way and always optimize performance and looking for new sources of alpha. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Adel Abdulali. I'm President and Chief Science Officer of Protege Partners and Move 37. Protege Partners has been seeding hedge funds for over a dozen years, and uh, Move 37 was started very recently in 2015 to try and capitalize on, on, on sort of the formation and growth of alternative data, data science, machine learning, and cheap and available computing on the web. So in that vein, we've started an incubator that is trying to help small startup companies start asset management businesses like traditional hedge funds, but using AI and machine learning as the decision processes. Well, hello, everybody. Um, bon appetit. Uh, my name is Alejandra Literio. I'm a co-founder and chief research officer in iCapital, that is a fintech, newly born. We uh, developed artificial intelligence algorithms for the financial markets. Uh, we also create a portfolio uh, management with uh, the sophisticated technology. We use also NLP in the design of uh, market drivers lexicon and financial lexicons for specific domains, as I said. And uh, I'm a linguist myself, so forensic linguist. And in this uh, particular area, also I work as a researcher at a university, and I'm also the director of my uh, multidisciplinary team of researchers at iCapital. Uh, hello, my name is Luis Valdich. I'm a managing director with City Ventures, uh, which is City's uh, innovation engine and uh, corporate venturing initiative. I'm responsible for our New York office and for our fintech venture investing activities across the US as well as uh, Europe and Israel. And we invest besides uh, fintech in other areas of enterprise technology that would be relevant to a large organization. And uh, as part of that, and relevant to the panel, obviously we spend a lot of time in you know, many of the fields of AI, alternative data, um, and the like that were mentioned by Anil earlier. So, um, so good to be here. And finally, I'll say we invest typically in companies with a couple of million in uh, revenue uh, to start and that are growing very fast. And our model is to make investments with a financial return angle, but also with a strategic angle, specifically with an angle in how relevant uh, the startup could be to city and or to our clients, and therefore our ability to deliver value add to the startups that we invest in. Thank you. Hello, my name's David Wolf. Uh, by way of introduction, I started off in electrical engineering, Purdue University, and then a medical degree, uh, MD at, from Indiana University. Worked in ultrasonics and flew jets at the time, combined the radar with ultrasound machines, and start, was part of the small group that started the digital ultrasonic era. And um, NASA hired me to build their instrumentation for the space shuttle at the time, and which I did. Uh, eight, nine years later, I had worked in tissue engineering in zero gravity, 
and you can see the laboratory there the last time I left it, the International Space Station. And uh, up there we do a lot of expert systems and for many years, which is kind of the beginnings of artificial intelligence, you might say. And now I'm the president and chief medical officer of Spectron Systems, which is a drug design company using artificial intelligence and me machine learning to greatly improve the process of molecule design for pharmaceutical medicines. So, you know, I, I, think, I think David is being very modest here. Can we just have a show of hands from the audience and panel members? How many of you have done a spacewalk? How, how many of you have, have been to outer space? So, so David is, is actually uh, a former astronaut who you want to describe your, your missions? Well, well I, four, four times in space, 168 days, seven spacewalks, flown seven spacecraft, and led the team that built that International Space Station, led the spacewalk team that built that uh, incredible orbiting international laboratory. So were there any uh, more pictures? Oh, I have some more slides. Yeah. So, so, so some cool Thank movies. you. Uh, Actually, you, you really should be aware of what's happening in space right now. Uh, the current administration is very strongly backing space, and we're moving into completely industrializing Earth orbit on through the moon and out to Mars for human exploration. Big program ahead. Um, did that go ahead two or one? I didn't do it. Uh, I don't even know where. So there's a picture up on the space station. That's actually the Russian space station. Uh, sometimes I prepare, prefer in Russian. But there we're doing tissue culture. Tissue engineering came out of this, three-dimensional tissue engineering. And you never would have expected this unique variable of zero gravity and spacecrafts, aviation you might say, aeronautics, to blend in and, and make an, an, a large advancement in tissue engineering. And it's typical when you mix uh, skill sets that aren't usually found together, and this is artificial intelligence, anyone that's tried to do this, how you blend the computational people with the skill, with the uh, technical experts from the conventional field to get the, the whole thing to work. So there, and this has more buttons than some of the jets I've flown. <laughs> So that is actually nervous neural tissue we're growing in space. We've learned how to do it on the ground, but I just wanted to show you that some rather amazing things can we get a jump start on in space. Next slide, please. We, at Spectron, we realize that we can disruptively enhance the pharmaceutical industry with artificial intelligence machine lear learning techniques. There's a dire economic need and it requires paradigm disruption in, an, in a positive way. Next, please. And I want to show you really how we do it. Uh, keep your eye on the machine for a second. Everyone knows you have various algorithms to do artificial intelligence and machine learning, deep learning, transfer learning, multitask learning. And we have our experts that do state of the art and some places we believe we've pushed the state of the art. But it's the data you work on and the curated data that's so important. And in the case of molecule design for medicines, if you use the ball and stick, you know, carbon connected to a carbon to an oxygen, the conventional ball and stick description of a molecule, and you, like this is showing, you encode the molecule structure, and then apply artificial intelligence to that, you don't get much. You get some rules of thumb that humans already know. So we pulled a trick in Spectron, and I hope the trick will be as good on this. Hit the down arrow, whoever is pushing this button. It should, yeah, it worked. So we've introduced a description of the molecules. We've changed it. We use, from ball and stick, we have a very computationally effective method to re-describe the molecules. And I'm not at liberty, I'd love to tell you how we do that, but we'll have to wait for due diligence. By the way, we're just now entering our Series A. After about three and a half million of pre-seed money, we're pretty much run through, we're ready for Series A. The FDA put about 20 million into this technology to get to this point and then before we licensed it. But we re-encode the ball and stick. We no longer look at a molecule as a ball and a stick. We, have, we transform that with, to a quantum mechanical sensitive space. The parameters are quantum mechanical sensitive, which the real entities are actually in the real world. 
and spatial sensitive. And when we retranslate, when we redescribe the molecules that way, now the AI really works. Now the things group up, the t liver toxicity, cardiac toxicity, uh, the various efficacies of the medicines group correctly and in a learnable way. So we convert the data with a transform that makes it learnable. Next, please. So sometimes you're on the outside looking in and wondering how you're going to get back in. And there's walls and boundaries. And how do we get away from that? And next slide. We can look to a place without walls and without boundaries. And that's really where artificial intelligence and machine learning is now. It's a new frontier, every bit as much as space is, to be explored and for the betterment of humankind. All right, thank you, David. So um, David had mentioned you know, the difficulty of uh, the, the mixture of skills that are required in order to, to do AI. So if I could start off with Alejandra. Um, do you have any, any thoughts on, you know, AI requires some data science, some computer science, some domain expertise. How difficult is it to find people and to, to manage teams to get this done? Well, Ken, that's an interesting question and I might allow myself and the audience to redefine or define because I was looking for a new terminology to this new breed of um, let's say, players or actors for Wall Street or even for any other uh, field of a study. And I thought about the meta-quant. The meta-quant is a new profile that is required in these challenging uh, new um, days where artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques are put into practice, let's say. So who's the meta-quant? The meta-quant is the one who is knowledgeable about other fields, such as uh, linguistics. Uh, they have to have a profound and deep knowledge uh, regarding forensic linguistics, cognitive linguistics, uh, anthropology, semiology, and um, everything that is related to the philosophical and ethical aspects. And you will tell me why. Because um, everybody has a different uh, perception of reality. So the way a linguist uh, sees reality is a very different way in which uh, the quant, that is the physics or the mathematician, sees the world. And this is a perfect match and combination, and we're looking for synergy in uh, the teams. Um, but how can we do that? Well, we have to find a common thread. What I mean by that is like we have to have a common objective in mind and transmit and uh, make our team of experts work together to a common objective or target, which in our case, because I work in the field of finance, is uh, create the robust and the best model to, in the end, make the investor uh, get gains and make money, because that is the only thing that matters when we're talking about finance, making money. And if you don't agree, please raise your hands. <laughs> I don't see any hands written, but right. anyway. So, but, so, so the common thread uh, is uh, finding this objective that everybody will have in common and, um, and make them uh, think in terms of this objective and uh, value their own level of expertise in each field and they can work together combining their knowledge to create the best model ever. So, so meta-quant, that's a new word for me, a uh, deal. Quants, do you deal with them meta or, or otherwise? Well, yeah, we deal with them. And I would say as far as uh, human capital goes in investment management, once you get into the ML, AI, data-driven strategies, the language that these people have to speak is not you know, the, the human languages, computer languages. So unless you know Python and R and all those things and those are normal to you, you're not really going to get very far with unstructured big pots of data at all. I mean, you cannot be working with a spreadsheet and look at petabytes of data. It's impossible. So the human capital is changing drastically in investment management in this sphere. And the MBA programs who aren't starting to teach their kids Python and R are doing them a disservice. Most people in high school are now learning those languages. I mean, 
My teenager doesn't use a calculator, he uses Python. And that's the way everything is going. Uh, and, and people better get on board that train. And uh, allow me to say that uh, they say somewhere else that the new bilinguals are not those who can speak at least two different languages. It's one language and programming. So this is a new bilingual, those who can speak code. Uh, and the languages in high school, I mean, in, in freshman and sophomore in colleges now, uh, you know, where you have your CV for summer internship, and the languages, they just list, like French, Python, R, it's, it's, it's the same line. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, Luis, venture capital, you always have the problem of finding people with interesting skill sets. Do you have any, any thoughts? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think that uh, the, uh, th these days, uh, most startups that we uh, look into have some angle around leveraging AI, machine learning, and the like, and therefore, you know, data scientists are very important and increasingly hard to find, by the way. And uh, incidentally, we've made an investment, haven't announced yet, though, on a company that helps any uh, individual without necessarily the deep uh, understanding of uh, statistics and data science you know, to leverage the data science in their models. Um, and this is in addition to having people, you know, coders, you know, people with deep uh, software engineering. So, so increasingly, I think the stakes to, to having teams that are, can be very effective uh, you know, is broadening in terms of the different skills that you need. Jorge, you're our economist here. Uh, has AI made its way into the economic field? Should it? Do you have any, any thoughts? Well, you know, we were just talking before the panel about our different backgrounds, and um, it resonated very much on the side of language and venture capital and, of course, microbiology, because in, we're right now in, in unprecedented times after the financial crisis, we're in unprecedented times for monetary policy, quantitative easing, uh, around the world, especially in the U.S., has um, distorted markets in a way that we've never seen before. So uh, one of the challenges we see right now in finance and in, 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 in for, for asset management and, and hedge funds in both uh, relative and absolute return is trying to understand the current environment. And unfortunately, we keep using old models and trying to adapt them to the current environment. And um, the opportunity lies in using new technologies in this unprecedented time to try to understand or kind of do it in an inductive way rather than a deductive way. So, um, for example, right now with quantitative easing, when we started this pro program in 2009, 2010, and more aggressively later on, I think it was 2012, um, everybody thought inflation would be triggered immediately and obviously interest rates, et cetera, and commodities. But um, I think we could probably use uh, and apply environmental sciences or geology uh, concepts to understand the process of getting out of quantitative easing. Um, the current amount of liquidity that is being stored, it resembles a lot like the ice age or glaciers that are thawing at a very, very slow rate. And um, even though we tend to look at just performance or spreads or stocks or commodities or things like that, it, it, it misses the main point, which is understanding the, fr the current reality. Uh, which is this uh, massive amount of liquidity that's slowly melting. So um, those are, it's for example, one small area where I think that multi, a multidisciplinary approach would yield interesting um, you know, observations. So we have a couple of people on the panel from, from finance backgrounds, and I'll, I'll plead guilty to that as well. But let me address the, the question to Adil. Does finance in particular pose a, a challenge for AI and machine learning? Well, whenever some new technique like AI and machine learning comes into finance, where, where up till now it's been run by the old guard that does things in the old way, there's a, there's a couple of problems. First of all, there's a cultural problem in the sense that the people who are in charge of a lot of large asset management companies and things like that, they're not necessarily engineers. Right? They're coming from the old business perspective. So they're going to be disrupted, so they have to watch out for that. And, and culturally, it's hard to put those two teams together, the engineers and the MBAs. So th that's, that's one of the problems. At the technical level, of course, the, the, you know, there's some classical problems with putting the sort of image recognition, deep learning type algorithms to work in finance. Because you know images, images of a cat, for example, 
stay, I mean, a cat doesn't change over time. The, the relationship to the ears and the eyes and all kind of stays the same. So you can train a machine with millions of pictures of a cat and, you know, it's kind of stationary. Whereas the relationship between different factors in the market change over time. I mean, you know, there's stocks and bonds can behave one way, and then there's a flight to quality and they behave in a completely different way. Now, that is a problem if you're thinking of machine learning algorithms as the classical regression type uh, algorithms where you test parameters on data, come up with the parameters, and then deploy the model, and then wait till it breaks, and then it goes back to the drawing board if it breaks. The machine learning data-driven algorithms, the whole architecture is set up so that it is trained on data that is constantly changing and changing its relationship to each other. So in fact, it ends up being better with regime change than the old human-inspired model. So it really is your perspective, and if you take the care to, to really feed the right data, and I mean, even in space, you were talking about pre-processing the data and your molecules, like the pre-processing the data allows the machine to learn. With that, if you just throw raw data at it, it's, it's going to be lost. And so most of the skill is in trying to use domain knowledge to pre-process the data in a way that then is easy for the machine to extract features that then you can predict with. So there are problems, but in fact, the tools that are available to solve those problems exist. They just have to be applied with care. So as someone who has recently been giving talks on the challenges of finance for, for AI, I'd just like to make two points about that. One is, if you take a look at image recognition, if you count the number of parameters you're estimating in order to come up with an image classifier, it's easily in the tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of parameters. So you need big data in order to do deep learning, a particular part of AI. In finance, we're not so fortunate to have a lot of data because time series data, daily frequency, only gives you 250 observations a year. So you may think there's a lot of data, but it's minuscule compared to the number of parameters <clears throat> that you need to estimate. The other point that I think Adil made also is the non-stationarity, is the difference between recognizing an image and trying to find an arbitrage or trading opportunity is once I recognize an image, I'm not changing how images will look going forward. If I've identified a trading opportunity with an AI algorithm and I act on it, I've changed the markets. And now the data that I trained on is no longer represented by the actual markets that I'm in. So I think finance actually is a very challenging area for, for artificial intelligence. Um, I'd like to, one quick add yeah. to that is that this dearth of data, like we don't have enough data to train a model. Well, if you can manufacture realistic data, then you might have enough to train a model. And that's not unheard of in finance. I mean, in risk management, if all you did was look at past history, and not do some scenarios based on what could happen, you're probably gonna get into trouble. Same thing, if you train your models with just the historical prices, then you are kind of stuck. You need to be able to manufacture what if potential market, train your model on the what if crazy markets, and then see if it still learns and behaves correctly. So there's just a few added steps which are logical if you think about them, and then it starts to work a little better. And also, uh, I was thinking about uh, these uh, let's say training in terms of micro and macro level, because you have to be knowledgeable of your own market. Suppose you design a model, maybe perfectly uh, well uh, and work uh, with the most, um, let's say, wanted results here in Wall Street, but the same uh, algorithm and the same portfolio will have a totally different meaning and results in Spain, in Argentina, and in other markets. So we have to think globally, but also at the micro level, because uh, nothing is guaranteed. You have to know your context first in order to gather all this information. Okay, I'm 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 uh, well aware that we have all the historical data because uh, we work on that, but also we have this new real time. Uh, data or data, as you prefer, uh, to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, complement or work uh, together in tandem to train this uh, algorithm. So my point is, okay, let's think about the macro global level, but also at the micro level, because the market changes in uh, every geographical area around the world. So I want to switch gears for a minute and talk about something that I'll label as generative AI as opposed to discriminative AI. 
most people think of AI is you start with inputs and your AI algorithm comes up with a prediction as what the output is. That's the discriminative. You can actually run this algorithm backwards and start off with an output as your goal and ask the AI to run its optimization in, re in reverse and come up with the inputs that actually meet that goal. So David, um, does that sort of describe how drug discovery is working? It does describe the way we do it. Uh, it is interesting. One can imagine that you can take all, the, we, we, in, we ingest the known molecules, the known medicines, and we know all about how they perform in humans. So we train on that. And so you can take a molecule that you have in a bottle, a molecule, and predict how it will perform. That's a different story than coming up with an altogether new molecule that will perform in a certain way. And we do run it backwards. Essentially, we pick how we want the molecule to perform in the body, and then we reverse the, the we wrap this around with a, a reversing scheme that we can now come up with the molecule that will perform that way if it's physically realizable. Uh, you can get lots of strange answers when you do that, like we were talking about before, because sometimes the molecules may be not stable, so you still need expert, domain experts involved. Right. So how many of you have been in a self-driving car? So, you know, along, good for you. So, so along this lines of reverse optimization, one thing that's actually possible to do now is you can sort of take your classifier and you could say, I want the classifier to recognize this picture to be a dog and run the algorithm backwards to come up with something that is classified as a dog but doesn't look like a dog at all. So the reason I bring up self-driving cars is it turns out now it's very easy via this reverse optimization to create a sticker, put it on a stop sign, and have your vision recognition system classified as a 45, and a 45 mile an hour speed limit sign. So I think before we all get into self-driving cars, to me, one of the real challenges for AI is reverse optimization can lead to what's known as adversarial examples. And I'd be very leery of, of having an AI decide actions for me once these actions are coupled to the real world. So. Um, well, I, I just want to add, I mean, you, you, that sounds a little scary. You're making it sound a little bit scary to go into self-driving cars. And I don't know if you've gone in in Ubers or Lyfts recently, but they're pretty scary drivers out there. And you don't know what type of things they've been smoking or how late they were up last night. So, you know, there, there's, there's some danger in the human way as well. Correct. But here I think I'm more worried about the natural intelligence than the artificial intelligence. But I, I take the, 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 the point. But um, anyway, it could be dangerous because artificial intelligence is trying to emulate how the human brain operates. So also it could be dangerous. Uh, if okay. we have bad teachers. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, again, switching gears, structured data versus unstructured data. Uh, uh, Alaska, a venture, venture capitalist, are the challenges that you see venture uh, entrepreneurs addressing now centered around unstructured data? Is, is structured data interesting to, to people anymore? I think structured data will always be uh, interesting, and it's what's under uh, being underpinning, you know, a lot of uh, you know work in finance and the like. But to a large degree, uh, the the explosive growth that we're uh, witnessing in big data is really coming from unstructured data, which is far more difficult uh, to wrestle. But it is really the combination of both. I think that. Um, just focusing on on one uh, you know uh, group of uh, of data is probably not the right answer. But we are you know fascinated about opportunities in in both. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, we uh, will be announcing you know soon a recent investment we've made on a company that uh, that captures uh, card spend transactional uh, data, which ultimately can be you know very structured, but. It is fascinating in terms of the things you can learn there in terms of, you know, trends in spend, uh, you know, which companies are doing better than others, emerging new companies and all types of use cases. But then on the flip side, uh, there are companies, uh, another one, in fact, that I'll be meeting soon, which is back to David and space, uh, doing fascinating things to basically capture weather. 
by leveraging uh, GPS uh, radio occultation. So when you know GPS signals get sent, the curvature of the Earth uh, shifts how they arrive, and that can help predict near-term and longer-term weather patterns much more precisely uh, than you know the standard things that are currently used. And obviously, just think about the possibilities in terms of having better weather models uh, supplied to the broad economy. So there's a combination of both, but clearly, it's the unstructured uh, data where a lot of innovation uh, is happening. Right. Jorge, you know, <laughs> as far as unstructured data goes, I think you've made the, the comment about traditional economics being probably the most structured. Uh, well, I put the words in your mouth, but <laughs> do you have anything to say about unstructured data as a way to evolve economics? Well, I would say that um, in economics, a traditional process was to you know define a model and then try to fit the data in the model or try to see if things work the new area area of, of research and application in machine learning and AI is to actually go like you know like they were saying kind of backwards and just um, um, the, I wouldn't say that there's unstructured there's a you know traditionally economics and finance are dealing with time series um, and there's uh, there are more time series now to be applied on but the new generation of, of unstructured data in large amounts in real time is creating more like a panel data type of applications, which is a slightly different approach. Um, um, so I, I would say that the, the, it's more like a philosophical approach first to the traditional modeling of finance and the way markets work, where you look at a time series, which are kind of are mostly structured, and try to l look at the structured data in an unstructured way where you just leave them open and see what comes out. Instead of trying to estimate parameters, let, let the algorithm iterate and, and create new scenarios, back to what Adele was saying before, new scenarios that are probably not, not up, you know, cannot be generated or foreseen by traditional models. So, um, and I think we see this constantly uh, on our day-to-day -day, uh, operations. You just need to look at the performance here today of most hedge funds to understand why this is so challenging. We have the brightest minds right now in the world in engineering, uh, in language, in finance, in, in trying to create all these models. And you constantly see this uh, dog chasing its tail every time there's uh, new data that comes out and everybody chases the drop or every try tries to pick up the, pick up the top. So um, it is mostly challenging. It's interesting because those types of trends have always existed, you know, since the beginning of, of, of financial markets. So um, it's the human psychology and human behavior which is behind the models. So it's people driving the models and creating the models to tell them what to do. And, um, and it, it, you almost need to go in front of that and, and anticipate that that is something that would happen to try to um, create new opportunities and generate alpha. So it is fascinating in that sense because uh, we see a lot of engineering power and the brightest minds and um, they're, you know, they're just a race to be too fast and too smart, which is probably uh, a, an interesting irony of this whole process. Anil, I'd love to hear what, what you have to say in terms of how, what some of the autonomous learning investment managers you're seeing are using. Well, the, the most interest, interesting stuff is coming from the unstructured non-financial data. Because if you think about all the quantitative investment that's been done to, up till now, it's all been focused, including fundamental guys, including everything on structured financial data that you get from Bloomberg, Reuters, and all that stuff. So there's no low-hanging fruit there. There's no alpha hidden there. Everyone's been going after it. Everyone's going after the same data. It's very hard to even imagine that there's some hidden gems there. When you look at unstructured non-financial data, first of all, it's just been produced in the last few years. So no one has been working on this data for dozens of years because it hasn't even existed for dozens of years. The relationships that are coming out that are very unique that wouldn't be possible using the old techniques of linear regression or piecewise linear functions or anything like that. So you need these thousands of parameters for to figure out what the structure of this data is. So all the low hanging fruit, the alpha, the returns that are orthogonal to all the old style returns because if you do a machine learning algorithm and this big data stuff, the last thing you want is have end up with a momentum strategy. That's really boring. You want something that is slightly different. So if you start with very different data, you have some chance of getting off the ground in a good way. So um, let, let me sort of uh, end with a, a wild card question. So we have people from really diverse disciplines here. I've been prodding Jorge to, to try to get uh, 
uh, AI involved in economics. What disciplines that haven't already been addressed do you think are, are ripe for disruption by AI? So does anybody have uh, an opinion? Well, maybe this sounds a little bit um, shocking, but I was thinking about a sort of new paradigm. May, let, allow me to say that. Uh, that with the use of this new technology, with the aid of artificial intelligence, big data, analyzing the structure and structure data, maybe, just maybe, I'm saying, don't kill me, or I'm going to say, black swans are not so black after all. Maybe they are gray, or they could even white. Why not thinking about that? Imagine the many possibilities that you have with all these data available globally. If you have the chance to have this robust algorithm to read and reinterpret these events that they may, may seem unlikely, but not unpredictable, because you have new tools to reach what is unpredictable, maybe, as I said, you can find the needle in the haystack with a big magnet, that that would be artificial intelligence and big data. So, you know, as far as the prediction of black swans, it reminds me of the joke that my model predicted 10 out of the last seven recessions. So, so sometimes your, your models will predict things that don't actually happen, and that's sort of like the danger of asking machines to, to do too much. Uh, anybody else uh, have final thoughts? Well, I think that uh, you know, Spectron should start working on molecules for you know new mixologies, because I mean you know they they have some now AIs that are being deployed into creating new types of foods, but I haven't seen it for new types of drinks. Like imagine new alcohol that that doesn't get you all you know completely out of phase, but you can just feel good or completely new. Like you know if you look go into a bar, all you see is the same old drinks. You know you have your tequila drinks, you have your vodka drinks. You need to come with a new one. I think NASA would have a conniption. <laughs> yes, and, and we thank you for ingesting your molecules of lunch while we, we spoke today, and we hope you enjoyed the panel. So thank you very much, and we'll thank the speakers, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.